I'm going, okay. okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. This will be kind of fun. You guys are my guinea pigs, actually. So something that's coming down the pipe, well, it's, it's down the pipe, but it's just gonna be kind of a long, slow draw down the pipe, is antibiotic stewardship. And I needed to uh, try this thing out on you guys so that as we start having these discussions, we're using the right words, and that we know what our role is when it comes to patient care and antibiotic stewardship. So one of the funny things that I've really enjoyed over the past several months is comparing how I learned something to how somebody else learned something. Because even though we all go to school and it's more or less standardized, I'm finding out it's less standardized <laughs> rather than more standardized. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to nursing school, it's different than what you you get taught the same concepts as somebody in pharmacy school or somebody in medical school, but you may have gotten somebody who had a bee in their bonnet about this, whereas uh, somebody else maybe didn't get that same impression. And so I feel like we kind of have to review a lot of these things and come back to basics and just check in with what we know and then challenge each other when we see something that doesn't jive with what we were taught. So that's where I'm hoping to go. So. This one, um, I'm actually doing a four-part um, brown bag series, and the, and the first three are on uh, bacteria primarily, and then the last one's really gonna focus on viral illnesses and what we can do to prevent that. So a lot of this is gonna re be repeat to you, but I hope you think about it in terms of how we're doing this on the floor, how we're doing this in the clinic. Is there a better way to approach it? Do we need to approach it um, as we try and turn around and teach uh, other people around us. So I do have, I do have some objectives that uh, for this very first one are gonna seem really basic. So how do we differentiate between bacteria, virus, and fungi? How do, uh, we have some terms we need to define. Uh, why do we categorize into gram positive and gram negative? I want us to identify the bugs that we expect to see walk through the door here at MHSC. That's often called our antibiogram, actually. Um, identify which bacteria here are actually going to cause illnesses. Talk about our most common nosocomial infections and identify methods of infection transmission. And then I just want to share some, some pearls with you on, on all of these things. This is like a very wordy slide, and I passed this out, and you can look through it. Oh, it's probably also in two-point font now that I think about it. Oh. <laughs> but I can send this out to where it makes more sense. Um, in school, I learned... I learned to categorize bacteria. I used to, we, we learned to categorize them, categorize them as, um, there were a couple of swear words, so I interpreted them. So assassin is one that will just come in and, and knock you down and slay you, and, and that's a bug that'll just take over. You don't eat, you could be healthy one day and you're just now down on your knees the next. A bully is actually an opportunistic infection. You already have to be sick and it just comes <laughs> along and kicks you for the fun of it. Um, we need to talk about colonization, you know, bugs that live on our bodies, but they don't actually make you sick. Uh, what does community acquired mean? It's infection that occurs due to normal social contact. What does contagious mean? It means that that window of time in which you are passing on your infections to other people, or you have the ability to do that. Um, there are some differences in bugs. Some are aerobes and some are anaerobes. Aerobes require oxygen to live and anaerobes do not. And then there's something in between called a facultative anaerobe that can kind of mix and match. Uh, and, and a lot of this stuff really just means I'm using these terms later on, so I don't want you to get thrown when you see them uh, as we're talking about them. We, we're going to talk about gram stains. We're going to talk about hospital-acquired or nosocomial infections. We're going to talk about uh, pathogens. Oh dear, I can't read my last word. I use the word pearl in here often to define something that might be of use to you. Pearls of wisdom. They're not necessarily mine. I stole them from somebody else. Um, and then we talk about serotypes, which are variations within a species of bacteria. So one of the things we have to remind ourselves about bacteria is they're a lot like us. They're cells that, that are defined. They have a lot of the same organelles that we have. But they are wicked fast at replicating why do we care about that? Well, it means there can be a lot of them really, really fast, right? So we can go from one bacteria right this second, and in 10 hours we can have 10 million cells. But what that should also tell us right off the bat is that the, um, the ability to transmutate, the, the ability to change that genetic information, there's mutations going on all the time. And what that tells us that the 10 million cells we see 10 hours from now 
can be very differentiated from that original cell. And that's why antibiotic stewardship is going to come into play, and we're going to talk about that later. Those 10 million cells are not going to be identical to the original cell, and if that's, those cells were exposed to anything along the way, that's where we end up with antibiotic stewardship um, discussion and problems and things that can happen. Um, so some bacteria are helpful. Think about cheese fermentation. We use them in sewage treatment and even in oil spills. Some are pathogenic and cause disease, which we're also familiar with. Common illnesses caused by bacteria include UTIs, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, endocarditis, and other skin infections. This, on the other hand, is a virus. There's been a long debate for a long time about whether viruses are alive. Um, I'm not going to even address that. It's up to you right now. <laughs> um, we aren't sure if there's any beneficial viruses. I don't know that um, that comes readily to mind. Um, some people are saying there's possibly some out there, but we haven't found any. The ones we're familiar with are not that beneficial. Uh, the thing that we all know and that we were all taught is that antibiotics have no effect on viruses because they were designed for a different type of life organism. Illnesses caused by viruses include the common cold, influenza, Ebola, HIV, otitis, <coughs> media. And the, these are often described as just the genetic material. So genetic material being passed from one place to another. Okay, and then our, my favorite is fungus. Very slow replication. Whoever's had to wait for a fungal culture to come back knows that it can take weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, some are helpful. We actually use them in anti uh, antibiotic development, bread leavening, pest control, and some are pathogenic and can cause disease. Um, athlete's foot, yeast infections, the rare, rare fungal meningitis are kind of examples of uh, fungus. So here's our quick quiz. What's a medication called that fights bacteria? Antibiotic. Antibiotic. Great. What about that causes or that fights viruses? Such Antiviral. Antiviral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. What is a medication that fights a fungus called? Antifungal. Antifungal. Okay. Great. <clears throat> now, number four is actually I just threw that on at the last at the last minute, so I need to fix my other slide. But what's another name for an upper respiratory infection? It's the common cold. So when we see a URI diagnosed on an H and P, and we have antibiotics on, we need to do some digging, mm -hmm. and we need to find out was there something else that wasn't documented, or did we just make a mistake and not realize that um, that is not appropriate? So that's something I have seen four times in the last month. Only so we need four? to be only four, but that's because I'm down in the basement and stuff finally filters down mm -hmm. to me. You would probably see it more often if you're mm -hmm. on the floors. Now, um, so I just want to put that little piece in the back of your head. So microbes are different, and the drugs to treat them are specific to the type of microbe. And that's exactly why antibiotics don't even touch, can't even touch, a viral illness. Uh, patient education. So this is something I want you to think about in the back of your head. Antibiotic stewardship is all about healthcare workers um, trying to control the spread of unnecessary use of antibiotics. But there's a patient component that's very, very, very important here. And the, the, the problem that we face is we think of yourself as a patient. If you feel sick and you go to the doctor, what do you expect them to give you? You expect them to give you medicine. You don't go in and say, oh, maybe I'll talk to my doctor and he can give me some advice. That's not what we expect. And so we, when was the last time you educated a patient on the differences between their, maybe they had a viral infection, maybe they had an antibiotic infection. Did you actually address that with the patient? And did you actually take that moment to teach them the differences and why giving them a pill won't work? So I want you to just think about that in the back of your head. Okay, so we're gonna switch all the way back to bacteria for a while here and just talk about the bacteria we expect to see here at um, MHSC. So we do a gram steam. Gram scene is a really cool little old invention. Once upon a time, somebody was screwing around with uh, dyes, oddly enough, and they found that some bacteria stain purple and some bacteria stain pink. And oddly enough, that has to do with how their outside walls are composed. We don't need to go into a lot of that, except that what, what can gram staining help us with? Identification. Identification, and is it an early stage identification or is it a late stage identification? It's early, it should be within an hour. And the reason that's helpful is because we may not get a full 
um, we may not get a full um, scope of what the culture looks like and what the actual bug is because you have to grow it out. And, and in the microbe lab, they need to get some actual bugs that they can see under under a slide and they might need to see how it colonizes to see which speciation it is. But Gramstein can tell you right off the bat, I'm going to go for these antibiotics or I'm going to go for these antibiotics. So I have seen also this past month more than a few where the Gramstein comes back gram negative and all I've got on board is gram positive drugs. That's not useful. That's not useful to anybody. So if it's been a long time since you've looked up cultures on your patients, I need you to start looking that up. I need you to start getting familiar with that and saying, oh, I got a gram stain. Gram stain should be back like that. And if we're not getting those back, maybe we need to talk to the lab and figure out if there's something we're not helping with them with so they can't get that information right out of the gate. So gram stain in conjunction with the uh, differential based on their symptomology is what steers us towards our empiric antibiotics. So that's what we need to be looking at. Okay, so here's our gram positives that are, these are our top, I think I put our top five or top six um, here. So in 2015, we had, um, we had 36 systemic isolates of Staph aureus and four urine isolates. MRSA falls under this same kind of category, but there were 21 systemic isolates and seven urine isolates on that. Um, it exists everywhere in your skin. So sometimes you're going to get an infection and it's an opportunistic infection. So we're talking about pneumonia, bacteremia, cellulitis, osteomyelitis, endocarditis, meningitis, wounds, surgical site infections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can go on forever. This can be transmitted by touch. It's an opportunistic bully. It can also be a sample contaminant because it's on everything, right? So one of the reasons I have a pet peeve about um, respiratory cultures, unless it's a BAL, is because I am probably going to get a bunch of crap in there that really isn't an infection. So also, if you see respiratory cultures going around that are not specific to that disease state, that'd be a good thing for us to fix too. So MRSA is the is the really bad kind because penicillin can't touch it, mm -hmm. um, and then we need to know that, and so that pops up. MSSA is the susceptible kind, and so that means that penicillin can kill it, and in any situation, we should be using something a little. Uh, a smaller, more pinpointed gun than a really big bazooka to take care of MSSA. So I just wanted to let you know that's kind of what it looks like. Gram positives, at least in our hospital, for the most part, are little round ball-like things. So see, same kind of theme going on here. Uh, staph epidermidis is also all over our skin. And this one's famous for creating biofilms on implants. That's kind of where this bug likes to hang out and live. In 2015, we had seven systemic isolates and 18 urine isolates. This one's also transmitted by touch. It's also an opportunistic infection. Strep pneumonia, eight systemic isolates in 2015, and zero urine isolates because it's a respiratory bug. So <laughs> that's one of the things we need to familiarize ourselves is where do these things live? If I get a UTI back that says strep pneumonia, then I need to wonder about my process and see if there was something that shook out, or maybe we just swipe samples in the in the lab. Maybe that's what happened. Um, this is the one that the Pneumovax and the Prevnar vaccines are are for. This and so the 23 and the 13 indica indicate the number of serotypes that this is effective against. And so we'll talk about vaccines more at the in the very 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 last one that we're going to talk about. Um, Enterococcus is also round. We had 49 systemic isolates and 10 urine isolates in 2015. Two major types, Efecalis and Efacium. Efecalis is by, by far and away the highest percentage of those. These are facultative anaerobes, so they've got lots of mobility. So they can live in oxygen environments, they can live in non-oxygen environments, they can just live wherever they want to, want to live. Again, transmitted by touch. And these can live for weeks on a non-living surface. I like this word, so I put it in there. It's called a fomite. And that's anything that's <laughs> on non-living surface. Um, these cause UTI, bacteremia, diverticulitis, meningitis, endocarditis, and VRE that we've heard about, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, is in this family, this enterococcus species right here. OK, C. diff doesn't quite fit the mold. It is still a gram positive bug, but it doesn't look round like all the other ones. It's kind of this goofy looking squirrely thing. Uh, 2015 isolates that came in through the ER. We have a bunch of different things that Patty tracks, but I'm talking about stuff that comes in through our front door. 
Um, this is also part of our normal flora in the gut, and we're more susceptible to it, as we all know, when we're on antibiotics for something else. So that's another reason to keep our antibiotics under control, because maybe we're giving them to people who don't really need them, and then voila, we give them C. diff, guilty by association. Okay, so gram-negative, think everything else. Gram-negatives um, primarily are actually rod-shaped, especially the ones here at MHSC. So E. coli is part of the Enterobacteria ECA family. I kill that name every time. We had 10 systemic isolates last year. And check this out, 343 urine isolates. Where does this bug like to go? UTIs, that's where it belongs. Um, it's a facultative anaerobe, and then we have fecal transmission that really contributes to that. So this one lives in the guts. Um, there's so many different kinds. There's even kinds that we use to uh, grow drugs for us. And so E. coli is a very interesting, large, diverse family. It can cause food poisoning, UTIs, and sepsis. Um, it is one of the three highest nosocomial infection risks that we have here in the hospital. C. diff is another one, and we'll talk about the other one in a minute. Um, this can also survive outside of the body for a period of time, which is why it's so transmittable. Um, some of these serotypes are deadly, and uh, the one that is the 0157 colon H7 produces the deadly uh, shiga toxin. So when the, when the microbe is falling apart, it actually creates an endotoxin, and it's actually the toxin that's more dangerous to you than the actual living microbe. Okay, Klebsiella, another rod-shaped one, five systemic isolates last year. 51 urine isolates. Again, it's another urinary tract infection bug. Um, this is the one where we talk about ESBL uh, issues. So these are the extended uh, spectrum beta-lactamase, which means these bugs can pull apart all cephalosporins and also um, astrenam. So completely useless to use cephalosporins or astrenam on an ESBL mm -hmm. bug. So uh, the drug choice of... Uh, class of choice on this is anything carbapenem. So these are just little things we need to keep in the back of our head when we're looking at appropriateness. Okay, so Pseudomonas, 12 systemic isolates last year, nine urine isolates here. Um, this one's kind of, it's a, it can be on your skin, it can be found in soil and water, again, UTIs, can be pneumonia, can be sepsis, soft tissue infections, again, transmitted by touch. Uh, the Enterobacter family, we had zero systemic isolates last year and 16 urine isolates, again transmitted by touch, again it's a bully. And this one can cause respiratory infections, infections but it's probably more primary uh, urinary bug. Um, and then pro this one's kind of squiggly and gross. <coughs> it looks like it came out of Star Trek. And this is protease, and we had five systemic isolates last year and 17 urine isolates. Kind of same song, second verse, as all the rest of our gram negatives. And then Citrobacter, uh, just a few systemic isolates and very few urine isolates, again, causes UTI. This one's more likely in, uh, more likely a little bit in <coughs> sepsis, although you can kind of get sepsis from anything. But infant meningitis is another one that this one is here. So, putting it all together, these 11 things are what we expect to walk in the front door. Almost absolutely, positively, 95% of our patients, if they're coming in with an infection, it's one of these. Uh, the rest of ours don't even make a blip on the screen uh, for that matter. And we're not that different than anybody else. We're not out here growing our own funky donkey bugs. But just so you know, our antibiogram is completely different than the University of Utah's antibiogram. And the University of Utah's biogram, interestingly enough, is completely different from Salt Lake Regional's, which is only 10 blocks down the hill. So your patient population isn't always your geographical area, it's are you getting patients from nursing homes? Are you getting patients from out of state? You know, what's your case mix index look like? You know, are people shipping patients to you? So we have a pretty typical uh, antibiogram for being a small community hospital. This is kind of a fun little graph you have in your packet. It just gives you an idea. I've highlighted the ones that, that we talked about today of, of where all these bugs live, which is kind of a nice little reference point. Okay, so here's what I really, really want to talk about. Um, our um, biggest risk of transmitting infection, and, and this is a big risk of transmitting infection anywhere, is by touch. And so I am going to remind everyone, I think I printed it on your things, but maybe it didn't come across on my, I don't know if I printed it on your things. Let's look. 
Um, I was I referenced, I hope I referenced, and maybe I need to go back and fix it. Oh, I do need to go back and fix it. Dang it. Okay, so Patty reminded me that we have, what's it called again? The infection prevention guidelines. Infection prevention guidelines binder that's on ICU, med search, OB, ER. and ER. So that's where your guidelines or that's where the, the little sheets are that you can hang on the door that says this is a droplet precaution or this is a respiratory precaution. And the reason we're supposed to do such fantastic hand washing is because so many bugs can just be sped on their way by touching the patient or touching something else. And I am guilty of this where I think, oh, I'm just gonna run in for a minute, but I'm not gonna touch anything. And I'll be dang if that's the time the patient says, will you grab that cup over there and hand it to me? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, sure I will. And then I gotta remember that I didn't really put gloves on when I came in. And so when I'm going out, I'm like, okay, I gotta remember to scrub and wash. But it's so funny when you have in the back of your head that this is your intention to go in, but that's not really what happens. So we need to be looking at those binders and we need to be doing a better job of making sure that all the precautions get put up. Kiddos at MHSC, if they're kids and they're up in the, on the inpatient floors and they're not a newborn, I should have said that, always get respiratory precautions, always. And then if it's RSV, they need to also be um, contact precautions because that can be transmitted by touch. So we really need to do a lot better job of making sure that we are, are preventing the passing of some of these things. And sometimes too, you don't know you get a hospital acquired infection until you're home for a day or two and you were the patient. You're like, what is this crazy thing I just came down with? And then those may or may not be reported. So sometimes, sometimes those could be underreported for sure. So I need us to be paying attention to that. So pearls of wisdom. Microbes replicate quickly, which increases their chance for mutation and eventually drug resistance. It can happen very, very quickly. Uh, decreasing our spread by touch is our best defense against infection and against antibiotic resistance. Colonizations, colonizations are not the same as infections. I don't think we have as big of a problem with that here. At one of my last hospital systems, they felt that if they swabbed swabbed you here, there, and everywhere for something they had to treat you for it. So that's, that's good that we're pretty, we're pretty good at that. We do need to remember that antibiotics only treat bacterial infections, and we need to make sure that we are doing our part to educate patients on that. Patients don't like hearing, I'm not gonna send you home with a med today, but they need to hear that. They need to get that connection because we aren't doing our job if we're setting them up for the expectation that if they come into the doctor's office, we hand them a pill. We do a very bad job at that, and um, it's one of one of the reasons uh, we're going to talk some more in sessions two and three about uh, what the status is in this country right now of our antibiotic drug development, and where we can expect it to go, and how fast the microbes are catching up with us. So, I have a little bit of a quiz for you, and we can go through it real quick, which is kind of fun. So what characteristics describe bacteria? Choose all that apply. Have a cell wall, but no nucleus. None of their species are helpful to humans. Colonize human skin and produce asexually. So we have all kinds of fun things in there. Does anybody have any fun guesses? C and D. C and D, yeah, that's great. Okay, true, false. Viruses and bacteria are interchangeable names for the same microbe. Oh. Great. The difference between gram positive and gram ne negative microbes are, pick one. Do you guys remember? It's kind of tricky to keep them straight if you haven't thought about it for a while. For a while. B. Yeah, it's B. They have a peptidoglycan uh, as the outermost wall. Which when we talk about drugs, that will make sense as to why we even care about that. So which of the following gram positive bugs do we see a lot at um, oh, that should be MHSC, sorry. Select all that apply. B and D. B and D. I do see a few C's up there. <laughs> but sometimes, I'm <laughs> just kidding. I haven't showed this to Dr. Brown yet. I'm really, ah. Do what? Uh, she's giving Charlene a hard time asking her for a copy. Oh, she does here. have a bigger copy. I know. Wait, I have. Oh. It oh. might be on your last page. Sorry about that. Hi. That's why you guys can't read it. Sorry. Well, right when I can bring some down it. to the ladies down here. <laughs> so, do you guys remember what shape I said most of SLRNC's grandpa's bacteria are? 
So what about the gram negatives? What shape are they usually? Uh, yeah, they were usually rods. Okay. Um, what kind, on question six, which of the following gram negative bacteria do we see a lot of here? E. coli. E. coli, we see a lot of that. It's like our favorite bug. But it's everybody's favorite bug. Half the population is female and women get UTIs. Ta-da! Mm -hmm. um, which bacteria are responsible for most nosocomial infections? E. Yeah, let's see. It's all of them, right? What is the and what about nine? What is the most common manner of nosocomial infection spread? C. C. You're right. So what's the difference between a bacterial colonization and a bacterial infection? C. C. Right. Exactly. What about D? I've had people floating around the world that think D. Is that true? No, but in this hospital it seems to be. Okay. Yeah, right. that's a common thought. It is a common thought, and it's difficult, right? Because sometimes, sometimes that's brought on ourselves by over-testing for things, right? So we've isolated the source of their infection, but we also decided to swab something else, or we decided to stick something someplace else, but they weren't actually having um, an infection from that. Or like the classic example is, you know, a woman who comes in complaining with a cough, but we give her... Um, we give her a UTI test. She doesn't have any signs or symptoms of a UTI, but she's growing something funky, and we think, oh, we're supposed to treat it. Or if they've been treated for MRSA in the past, mm -hmm. for some reason, we seem to think that they are positive for MRSA now. Right. So and it's not we that thinks I'm, that. Not we. The CDC it's, guidelines that say that. that but, right. They're right. looking into that more now. Right. They're doing more research into it. They just last month or so, or maybe two months ago, changed that... Um, like the visitor um, guidelines, whether or not they need to be in PPE or not. So they've kind of said, okay, we've done our research and we can relax. The parents don't have to be all gowned up and everything. And But if someone's got C. diff, yes, we need to be educating the visitors and we need to give them the right. appropriate precautions. Right. But the education needs to happen with the, um, the family and the patient about how this specific whatever they have transmits to other people like RSV okay you don't have to wear your stuff in there no PPE but when you go home and you have other children or you take your grandma lives with you or you go over and take care of grandma and you're leaving the hospital to go take care of grandma you need to go home change clothes take a shower maybe and then go head over to grandma because what makes us have a cold can make them um, yes, we do. yeah yes, so what we have to do and as far as um, the, the contact precautions on like MRSA and that kind of thing, they're, they're saying that uh, we're around it all the time, we can go to Walmart and we have it, good hand hygiene, you know, that's why they're look, kind of looking into that, but we also need to look at what's going on with the patient, we need to critically think about, okay, this person had MRSA in both knees last 10 years ago. Okay, well, where have they lived since then? What are their risks? Are they, have they been at home and they've been healthy ever since? Or have they been in a skilled nursing facility? Or do they um, live with somebody that lives in a nursing facility that they're in there day in, day out, so they're more at risk of having those multi-drug resistant organisms being around them. So yeah, they could be colonized. When they get immune compromised, I think that's when, you know, that's the risk where, um, are they hacking and coughing and sneezing in, um, junk up and putting them on their bedside um, and they're colonized, well, you know, it's in there. That means those bugs are in there. It's not making them sick, probably, but it can be transmitted to you and then you go on to someone else. And that's where we get hung up. Right. If somebody's been at home and they had MRSA 10 years ago and they've been healthy ever since, do I think that's a high risk patient? No, I don't think that. But you have to ask those questions to the patient to see okay, what are the risks um, for me and what are my risks for my patients next door or the other patients? And she um, reminded me, so on lip and cut are all of our precautions. So that's super, super helpful. So it's under contact precautions or it's under droplet precautions. And there's a lot of really good information on there on specific 
specific infection risks and what we what we can expect and what we should be doing. But the reason I'm telling you guys all this is so that as we go forward and we start having these crazy discussions and lots and lots of them on antibiotic stewardship, hopefully you can generate some ideas on how can we help each other out, how can we uh, change I mean, we have so many goals that need to be accomplished. You know, first we need to educate patients to, to own this understanding. You know, maybe they didn't have high school biology or maybe they don't remember high school biology, so they don't remember some of these things. But if we don't teach them, nobody will. And so I think, I think that's our first biggest burden. And then we have, to, we have to be on top of questioning each other and saying, so did you really mean for that to happen? Because if I remember my teaching, I remember ABC, but I see XYZ here on the order. Should we take a look at that, and should we see if that's really um, what's indicated? And then we have a great resource in PADI. So if we have infection risks, or we have something that we see happening over and over again, we need to figure out how to get that information to PADI so that she can look into it and help steer the ship where we're going on that. Because I do review all the cultures, the positive cultures, and I make sure that they're on the right medicine upstairs. and. I'll call the pharmacy and say, so they're on this, what do you think, and I don't see it on the sensitivity, or I don't think that this antibiotic goes with this, this um, bug, so what are your recommendations, what, is, what does your resource tell you, because it could be an, a, an antibiotic that's okay, but maybe it's not that first line that we should be using. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so when I call the doctor, or I call you on the floor and say, hey, so I noticed this person has this, and they're on this antibiotic, and can you ask the doctor if he wants to take a peek at that um, susceptibility and maybe change antibiotics? I'm saying that because I already looked at it and then I verified with the pharmacy and now I'm calling you. <laughs> but a lot of times they just haven't had a chance to yeah, look yeah. at that stuff. So, and, and I don't know if it would be helpful for the nurses to learn how to read the, uh, suscepti the susceptibility um, labs. Sometimes people are like, oh, I know what that means. But I've actually learned a lot um, just because this is the greater than or, um, or less than 32, and this one says two, and this one says six. Each antibiotic is different. Like, you it's can't not compare, compare them. You can't compare them. Like, you can't say, oh, this one looks like it's better. <laughs> you can't compare them like that. Right. So, and so we're going to talk about that in probably the, I can't remember, third one. Okay third one I think is no, I think so we can talk about that I think it's really helpful mm -hmm. because and that's the other thing is I think we need to keep more eyes and ears on that because the doc puts him in and like you said Charlene maybe he's like hasn't gotten around to it but what if we're approaching the 36 hour window and we're still on big gun antibiotics that's not good and that's where or we, we're still on three or we're still on three mm -hmm. that's the other thing yeah mm -hmm three antibiotics when we really could just be down to one. Now this has some impact, sorry I see some clinic people back there. This actually has some impact on in the clinic side too because it's actually you guys who get hit up when the patient schedules an appointment with the doctor. You know maybe they're not sick enough to come to the ER so they don't come to the ER. But they call and they say you know I've kind of had this funny feeling or I've had this little thing and if that's another place where you need to be on the front lines explaining to the patient yes we are going to prescribe an antibiotic no we're not going to prescribe an antibiotic and here's why we think this is more of a viral process um looks to me like you've got athlete's foot so you're not you know we're going to take care of it this direction rather than taking care of it another direction and so we just need to slow down and explain to the patient and if we can get their buy-in then you know we've got one more convert to, to help us out on that. And then they turn around and they explain that to their families. Oh, I know why you didn't get an antibiotic. You probably just had the common cold. Or you didn't get an antibiotic because you had the flu. Something like that. So definitely, it's not just a hospital problem. It's a hospital, it's a problem anywhere we have patients. So. Renee, I just have a question. I, yeah. I don't know if they still do this or not, but I remember patients being covered with antibiotics prophylactically because they have the comorbidities, they have all the lung disease, etc. So often doctors would cover you with something just in case or preventing something else happening. Right. So in some it's very disease state specific. 
So there's some disease states where um, you can be on a prophylactic antibiotic for a certain period of time or for a certain procedure. Uh, that's usually where a good example of a procedure is like, um, you know, maybe they had uh, MRSA grow in the nares and they just don't, um, they don't want anybody, they don't want the surgical site. They're going to go in for surgery. They, you know, swabbed MRSA in the nares and so they give them um, a little bit of antibiotic cream to swab in their nose seven days before they go in for surgery and that and that's just to keep it from you know flying out of their noses and landing into the surgical site so it's very disease specific it is not a recommended practice now that's um, probably why we have the resistance now right exactly if that happened yeah exactly mm -hmm. it, it's really awful and, and if you stay on um if you stay on antibiotics for um, any length of time, you know, and you keep getting, a really good example are the cystic fibrosis kids. Mm -hmm. So cystic fibrosis seeds are truly colonized, but they're colonized with some pretty toxic bugs. Well, they'll never, every time you treat them and they come in patient, we don't have them here, but every time you come in and you treat them in patient, all you're doing is tamping down the infection. You're never getting rid of it. And so over time, as they go from one exacerbation to the next exacerbation and those could be three months apart they could be three years apart but over the course of time the antibiotics just have to keep ramping up and up and up and up because we can no longer fight those so yeah prophylactic antibiotics should be incredibly carefully done and done strictly i think according to guidelines cdc or ism and they've right. even said the skip yes. protocol that you know mm -hmm. calls for the um antibiotics prior to surgery. Um, there have been a couple research to, um, research thing um, done on the uh, the use of those and why it has increased our rate of C. diff um, mm -hmm. after that because people mm -hmm. that were, that was the only antibiotic exposure that they have are coming back with C. diff. And so um, <coughs> they're looking at that even though the recommendations still are the the antibiotic, it's just people are starting to look at why are our rates increasing for the C. diff. So, I mean, yeah. the things that have been done forever, you know, they're kind of changing their minds on those things. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift because when antibiotics first came out and they were so successful mm -hmm. at doing what they were supposed to do, it was kind of like, um, Antibiotics for everyone. They're harmless. Everybody they're harmless. thinks they're harmless. Right. And, really, and I think now we're figuring out. I mean, the FDA just put some added. Um, restrictions or guidelines, I guess, on antibiotic use, like the, the Leviquins and the, mm -hmm. those types of things. Yep, because, that came out yesterday. Yeah, well, yeah, um, because of the harm that they're that's doing. And I noticed mm -hmm. Dr. Curry now is asking to see if they're resistant to the Leviquin and the Cipro. You know, I have seen, and it's been coming on for over the last year, but I've been seeing more resistant to the Leviquin and the Cipro because we've used it. Mm -hmm. We've right. used it for things right. that are right. just simple UTIs. We need to keep those for the complicated <coughs> UTIs. But you know, people are are so many people are allergic to sulfas. Yep, that's true. But we do have a few other like tricks in our bag that we haven't used for a while. So we're going to talk about those you know, next time. You know, everybody seems to be allergic to sulfur and penicillin. And and. and what do we do as far as um, when somebody says, We're, I'm allergic to that? Oh, what happened? What happens, you know, what happens? I get really sick, I puke my guts out. Right. And I'm like, yeah, okay. That's a right. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. allergic to EEMs because yeah. yeah. everybody gets sick with it. Or augmenting. <laughs> well, and that's another opportunity for a patient discussion. So if we're, if we're faced with having to put someone on it, and their complaint about sulfa drugs was, I threw up, I threw up, I threw up, you know, and given no other, and, they didn't break out in a rash, they didn't have anaphylaxis, they didn't have all these other things. That's where we need to talk to them and say, okay, so here's here's a decision point that you can make. And I think sometimes we exclude them from that decision point and say, what we would prefer to do is treat you with a very targeted, uh, very targeted antibiotic that's gonna have less of an impact on your system than I would like to whip out a Leviquin 750 for the next 10 days when maybe this is their first UTI. And maybe, you know, they don't live in a nursing home and they're not self cathed and a whole bunch of other things, right? So we really need to start looking at that and start educating them because patients are smart and we just don't give them the credit for um, understanding things. 
And so if we do have to take that time and, and bring them on board and say, we can do this or we can do this, but the consequences for each are And they here. take two rounds of this antibiotic, which makes you on for this long, or mm -hmm. you can use this. And yeah, you might feel, be sick for a few days, but right. you may get rid of, you're most likely going to get rid of that. Right. So, and, but we have some other drugs too that, um, that we haven't used for a while because they fall out of favor. People just forget about them and they don't use them. And so that, and we find that when we bring those back on, they actually have a higher incidence of uh, utility, like they actually work, um, because we just haven't used them for a long time. So bugs haven't had a chance to really get resistant to them. And so that's what we're talking about next time. Next time we're talking about empiric antibiotics and targeted antibiotics. And we need to have it really firm in our heads, which is which. Leviquin is a total big gun. It is a huge bazooka, and so if you have a little tiny UTI, and it's your first or second one, then it may not be appropriate. So we need to talk about that and put those things in their pers in their appropriate place to see if we can do better. But anyway, any other questions? That was it. That was super fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, Thanks so much. Also, I'm going. We're